Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, multi-class LDA. I started talking about that a little bit last time. I'm also going to talk about what's called the multinomial logic, which is one of the workhorses in economics. And then I'm gonna talk about problems with uh, Bayes rules. Uh, and we're going to get introduced to the terms uh, specificity, uh, sensitivity, precision, recall, a whole plethora of names, plethora of names. We're going to get introduced to the uh, ROC, the receiver operating curve. We're going to, uh, characteristic, we're going to uh, get introduced to the area under the curve, which would be something like an R squared. And then after all that, I'm going to say, this is the wrong way to do it. It's something that, that uh, I claim the machine learners have been doing wrong for a long time. And some of them admit this too. And then we're gonna go into some, well, not exactly basic economics, uh, but basic economics. We're gonna do some utility theory and I'm gonna introduce you to uh, uh, so-called decision theory. And decision theory is the right way to handle the problems with Bayes that, uh, I'll be talking about, okay? So let's start with K classes and P variables, okay? So we have K classes. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. We have P variables. And what we're going to do is we're going to do LDA. And it's gonna be very similar to what we've talked about in the case where there were just a few, no, uh, two classes and one or two variables. But the other thing I'm gonna show you is how to convert discriminant functions into probabilities. And I'm gonna give you a formula and then that formula is gonna recur throughout the course. So here's our, here's our assumption, okay? We have Xi is distributed normal mu uh, K sigma, if I is in class K. Can you see over there? If you can't see over there, tell me I'm gonna draw a line so I don't write over there. I feel like we can see about here, but maybe not around like exactly on the spot of the light reflection, like the light. Yeah, I can't see where that is from here. For, for me, the light reflection is right here. Uh, and, it's and pretty cool. Okay, so. Is that okay if I don't write up there or should I go in closer? Um, maybe a little bit closer. Yeah, that's good, thank you. Okay. Even though I'm a Husky, I don't know if most of you know this, I was an undergrad at UW too. My PhD is from Berkeley though. Uh, even though I am a Husky, sometimes purple isn't the right color. Let's try, let's try black, okay? Now, X is a P by one vector. So this is a set of your characteristics, uh, your height, your weight, your GPA, um, can't be your gender, and you'll see why it can't be your gender. 
can't be your ethnicity. And you'll see why it can't be your ethnicities. And this will be some of the limitations on it, okay? Why can't it be your gender? Well, gender isn't normally distributed, right? It's zero one. Can't be your ethnicity. Let's say there are 12 identified ethnicities. Again, can't be normal. They're just, they're labels. They're, they're uh, dummy variables. So indicator variables or dummy variables aren't going to fit this. And so LDA isn't going to work for that very well. Okay. Mu K is going to be the expected value of X given, uh, I'll say, uh, I'll say given K. Okay, X1, expected value X2 given K, dot, 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 expected value XP given K. So that is, I assume <clears throat> that for each class, each one of your uh, independent variables or the independent variables has a different mean. Okay. So the means differ across variables, the means differ or the expected values differ across classes. In contrast, sigma is the covariance matrix of the X's. So I subtract off whatever the mean is and uh, I get the covariance. So this is the covariance between X I, X J, uh, and I'll do this. So when I do this, and this is a matrix, okay, it means that the ij term of this matrix is this covariance. And you would take xi and subtract off its mean. And so its mean is going to differ depending upon what class it's in. However, the covariance does not differ across classes. When the covariance differs across classes, you'll get something called quadratic um, discriminant analysis. And I don't think I'll talk about that very much. Okay. So this is our assumption. Okay. Uh, easy, to, uh, easy to estimate the means. It's actually easy to estimate this covariance. Uh, you have to do a little bit of adjustment because the uh, means are different, but they're easy to estimate. And then the uh, discriminant function, delta K of X is equal to X transpose sigma inverse mu K minus one half mu k transpose sigma inverse mu k plus log i k, okay? So what does that mean? <clears throat> So this is a vector with the transpose that's one by P. This is the variance covariance matrix of, of those and that's P by P. And I take the inverse, okay? So you could run into a problem here if you had some singularities. That is if you had multicollinearity between the axes. Similarly, mu K is P by one, that is for each K, you have a set of expectations, one for each variable. Minus one half, again, this is one by P, 
mu k is p by one, so the transfer is one by, a transpose is one by p. This is p by p, this is p by one. This is called a quadratic form. It's the matrix generalization of uh, a quadratic. And then finally, we have our log pi k, where pi k is the probability that we're in class k. So <clears throat> we know how to estimate this. 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 We know how to estimate that. And we know how to estimate this. This is just a fraction of your population or your sample that's in class K. And so we know how to estimate that. We have those estimated, and then what do we do? We'll see if this new eraser works better. Ah, it does. Uh, I'm gonna erase this, but I'm not gonna erase what's below it. So I have this delta K and uh, I'm going to uh, misuse terminology here, okay? I'm gonna say assign X to K if delta K X is greater than or equal to delta L X for all L not equal to K. Now, why is this an abuse? Well, you're not really assigning the X's. You're assigning the person to whom that X belongs. So if uh, you are a person and you have an X, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna assign your X. I mean, I'm assigning you, okay? So, I assign uh, an X to a class based on the value of the discriminant function. So you get assigned to the class that has the highest discriminant function for your X. Okay? So that's pretty simple. Uh, no iteration here. No uh, nonlinear stuff here. Does it look very nonlinear? Nonlinear estimation. Uh, and you get classifications. Well, sometimes you need probabilities. And remember, we went through a step where we had some probabilities and, uh, and then we were able to show uh, well, we didn't have probabilities really. What we had was densities, conditional densities. Uh, and what we would like oftentimes is probabilities. Why? Well, if you're doing a finance problem, oftentimes you need the probabilities. Okay. You also want to classify somebody into uh, a default class or not default class, but you might want to know for this person, What's the probability they're going to default? And how can I find, find that out? Turn it around a different way. <clears throat> Recall I said there would be a problem if you're that person that's at the uh, 0.51 and uh, and 0.49 for the other class. And I'm not really sure which one you belong into, right? I mean, it's close to 50-50. Now, if you're 0.99, then I say, I'm sure. I'm sure, or I'm pretty sure. If you're 0.01, I'm sure that you're in the other class, or pretty sure. But if you're around 50.5, I really don't know. Now, if I give you the result, the discriminant function, this will tell you what class you're in, but you go, you know, I'd like to know, uh, is this something I'm pretty sure, certain about or isn't it something I'm certain about? 
And it turns out there's a trick, they don't mention it in the book, um, for converting a discriminant function into a probability. And we're going to look at a function that's called the softmax. And, <coughs> and the softmax, we're gonna sh it's gonna show up throughout this course. So I'll call it the softmax, I'll identify it. Uh, you'll look at it and you say, wow, that looks kind of like a logic. And you're absolutely right. So I'm gonna maintain that discriminant function. Actually, I'm gonna rewrite it. So I have delta kx equals x transpose sigma inverse mu k minus one half mu k transpose sigma inverse mu k plus, and I'm gonna write correctly this way, natural log of pi uh, k. And I'm gonna have estimates on all of these things. And this is the estimated discriminant function. How do I convert this into a probability? <coughs> probability y equals k given x is going to be equal to this. exp delta k x divided by the sum L equals one through capital K. Let's assume we have capital K classes. I think I said that, but I'm not sure. EXP delta L X. Okay. And this function is called the soft max. It's called the soft max because it will be largest for whatever of these deltas is the largest. Okay, so this is the softmax function. And you notice it looks a little bit like a logic, like the logistic. Let's say that you just had two classes and uh, one of the discriminant functions was just equal to one. Then you would have uh, something that looked like a logic. This will come back and we will see this when we talk about uh, multinomial logits uh, uh, next. Okay. <clears throat> the key problem here is the assumption that the x's uh, for each k are normal or jointly normal. Uh, do I need to uh, talk about what the uh, normal density function looks like for a multivariate normal? Send me a note if, 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 if we do, and either I'll talk about it or uh, Herbert could talk about it. So uh, let's move away from uh, linear discriminant analysis. And let's move to so-called multi-class logits. Now, multi-class logits, I'm a great fan of because my early research was on this. One of my thesis advisors, Dan McFadden, got a Nobel Prize for this. Uh, and it's the workhorse, it is the workhorse in uh, marketing research. Uh, I'll, huge amount of econometrics, uh, psychometrics, other social sciences. And I'm gonna do this from the uh, utility point of view. This will be two times today we're gonna hear about utilities. We're gonna hear about them 
now, and then we're going to hear about them at the end of the lecture. Uh, and since you're economists, this isn't going to bother you. I will, I will tell you it drives the machine learning scientists crazy. By the way, that last little formula I gave you isn't in the book, uh, but it is, it is correct, okay? So what I wanna do now is I wanna consider a choice problem. So these are called discrete choice problems. Okay. And by the way, notice that this is not the discrete as in you're being furtive or secretive. This is discrete as in 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera. Now, what is a discrete choice problem? We have a person. We could also have a firm. We can have a decision-making entity. Let's just call it a person. We have uh, K alternatives. And the person chooses one. Or one of them. Not only do they choose one of them, they only choose one of them, one and only one. So this is, this is crucial. Uh, let's say it's possible to choose two, then what you do is you redefine your alternatives to have as a separate choice choosing two of them. But for now, let's just say that there are K alternatives. Now, what am I talking about here? Uh, you are going to buy a blouse. Uh, and there are a number of blouses you could buy. And you choose one of them and you buy it. We could also have a situation where you decide not to buy a blouse at all. So uh, do nothing. So do nothing is oftentimes an option as well. How do I model how you bought your blouse. Similarly, you're gonna buy a car. There are lots of cars to choose from. You choose one car. You don't choose two cars, you buy one car. How did you choose that car? What dictated whether you purchased it or not? Well, it's your utility. So associated with each one of the alternatives, you have a utility. You have a utility for the blouse. Each blouse has a utility, a different utility. Each uh, car has a utility, a different utility, and that's a utility specific to you, not to anybody else, specific to you. And so I'm going to make the following assumption. Okay. I'm going to say that UK for person I is equal to theta K for person I plus epsilon K for person I, where Epsilon Ki is a zero mean random variable. Uh, the theta is your utility, and we're going to give some structure to it at some point. Okay? And so 
be I choose. So I chooses K if UKI is greater than ULI for all uh, L not equal to K. And you can put a greater than or equal there uh, because that can happen. You could have a tie. Uh, what do you do when there's a tie? You assume that somebody tosses a coin and that makes the difference. Uh, or you just assume there can't be. So for the time being, uh, I will sometimes put this in here, sometimes won't put this in here. When you're modeling, what you do is you do the thing that is the easiest. I've said that before, I'll say it more other times. So you see this now, what this says is, I will choose K if the utility of K for me is greater than the utility of K uh, uh, L of any of the other things I could have chosen. And if there are things that are tied uh, for the best, I'll toss a coin. Okay, pretty simple. Utility theory, you all understand this, I'm sure. And so this is not something that is hard for you in the slightest. <clears throat> now I want to give some structure to this. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to write uh, the expected value of UKI, uh, whoops, whoops, whoops. Nope, I don't want to do that. Where did I put my values? I want to do something else. First, this is the same as I chooses K if EXP UKI is greater than or equal to EXP ULI for all L not equal to K. All that says is, is as long as I don't cha change the ranking, whatever is the maximum in this scale is going to be the maximum in this scale. Now, the advantage here is the maximum in this scale is going to be positive or at least non-negative, okay? And finally, I want to look at the expected value of EXP UKI. And I can write that as the expected value of EXP Theta Ki times EXP Epsilon Ki. Okay. And to clear this out, I'm going to write this as the expected value of EXP UIK, uh, KI, pardon me, is equal to, I'm going to assume that this expectation is say conditional on X, and this depends only on X, or that this doesn't depend upon anything random, but in any case, it's going to become EXP theta KI plus E, well, not plus times E, EXP epsilon KI. And now I'm going to start making some assumptions. Okay. Assumption one. Okay. 
the epsilon ki are identically distributed. That is, they have the same underlying distribution function. Do I need anything here? No. They're identically distributed, not depending on either K nor upon I. Okay, so that is their distributions don't depend upon those. If that's the case, then the expected value of EXP epsilon KI is equal to some lambda. It's some constant. I don't know what it is. I would have to specify what the density is and write it out. And eventually we would be able to do that, but that's kind of a a homework problem that you'll do in grad school and it's not very much fun uh, and uh, you don't really need it at this point. Okay, so if that's the case, this says that the expected value EXP UKI is equal to EXP theta KI times lambda. Okay. <clears throat> now I'm going to have assumption two. Okay. The epsilon ki are independent and have cumulative distribution function, CDF, F of epsilon equals EXP to the minus EXP to the minus epsilon. Okay. So every one of the epsilons has that distribution. Interestingly, you can derive this from first principles. That is, it really isn't an assumption. If you make uh, some reasonable assumptions about people's behavior, you can show that this distribution has to have this form. That's one of the things that Fed won the Nobel Prize for. Okay. So assumption one and assumption two, okay? And the result is, Probability y equals k. Uh, I won't put x in here. Equals exp. Whoops. Let's see. Are you able to see that? Uh, I'm going to move up there. Now, this is one of those formulas you absolutely have to commit to memory. So, probability y equals k equals uh, the ratio exp theta i k. Uh, I keep doing that backwards. Sorry about that. Ki over, I have to get rid of assumption one. But I want that. Over the summation, K equals, or I'll say L, L equals one through big K, EXP 
theta L I. Now, the lambdas are also in there, but you see what happens? The lambda all cancels out. So the same lambda occurs in both places. And so we simply write that. Recall that EXP theta KI was equal to uh, well, it is it is what it is. Okay. Um, I don't want to have to write this down all the time. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it another name. I'm going to call this the attractiveness of alternative K to person I. Okay. So that means that the probability Y equals K is equal to the attractiveness of K to I over the sum or the aggregate of the attractivenesses of all of the others. So for example, let's say that they're all equally attractive. Then this is going to equal one over K. So it says, you know, you're equally likely to choose any one of them because they're all equally attractive. It's because you'd be tossing the coin or the equivalent, you're tossing the die. In contrast, let's say that uh, AKI, uh, A1I is 10,000 and all the other uh, AKIs are two or three and you have 10 Ks. This would say, well, almost certainly you're gonna choose number one, because it has the highest probability. Remember, we say that <clears throat> uh, we're going to uh, uh, predict y equals k if that probability is the largest. Okay. And so these attractivenesses uh, become uh, quite important. You can also think about them kind of like expected utilities. They're not really, but you won't make very many mistakes. Uh, if you say that, you'll just have some statistician say, oh, wait a minute. And then you'll go, oh yeah, well, there's, there was a lambda in there and they all canceled out. And so you're right. They're not really utilities. They're off by a term lambda or expected utilities. They're off by a term lambda, okay? So this is the multinomial logit model. And it's very flexible, but we don't really have any model here. Okay. Uh, uh, as it stands here, if I had uh, N people and I saw what choice every person made, I wouldn't have enough observations to estimate a k high. I wouldn't have enough uh, uh, data to estimate this probability. Now, there are two things you can do in that case. One thing, and we did this in, in the Bay Area Rapid Transit study, any of you from San Francisco, that was the first project I was ever on, the BART project, where we were decide, we were saying, A, would it pay for itself? And the answer was, no, this will never pay for itself, and it hasn't. B, uh, is it going to change where people live? Well, nobody out there lived in Concord, Arinda, Lafayette, Walnut Creek, and those became hugely 
popular bedroom communities for San Francisco because of BART. Similarly, going south, going north, places that nobody would have thought of living in, suddenly you had people living there. And it was because of very rapid transit. And uh, as I said, my thesis advisor, uh, one of them, uh, he was the principal investigator on the project that came up with these estimates. So one thing you could do was survey people. Okay? And we'll talk at the end of the course, we'll talk about A-B testing and surveying. We won't talk about that now. Right now, we're going to talk about so-called observational data, which we did not have. We actually did surveys. But we're going to talk about observational data. And we want to know how to model these probabilities. That is, I want to estimate the attractiveness. I want to estimate theta ki. One of the things I want to point out to you why I did the uh, E to the theta ki is because I want these attractivenesses to be positive so that this is always a probability. So this always sums to one, okay? So uh, in the case in which you had two choices, this is a version of the logistic regression we already saw. So how do we model something like this where it's so complicated that we can't get enough data, we could never get enough data to estimate these thetas. We put structure on it. And I've done this once before, I'm gonna do this a number of times. Uh, and we're gonna talk about that right now. <coughs> so let's take the simplest possible model. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna model <clears throat> theta ki. And the question is, what should those models look like? Okay. Model one. Theta ki equals theta a constant. I hope you see that if that's the case, you have that PY given uh, PY equals K is going to equal EXP theta over the summation L equals one through K EXP theta equals one over K. Okay. So it's a legitimate uh, uh, probability, but what it says is that for every person, for every uh, blouse or every car, they're all equally likely. You're equally likely to buy um, a uh, well, a car. I don't know if. They even sell those anymore, or a Yugo, uh, as a Mercedes Benz. You're as likely to buy a uh, $5 uh, blouse as a uh, $2,300 designer blouse um, from uh, Versace. It probably costs more than that. Well, that just doesn't make any sense. If you had a model like that and uh, you went in to a retailer and said, yep, you know, it really doesn't matter. It's going to be equally likely they'll just throw you out. What's the problem here? Well, let's forget for the moment that people are different. Let's forget for the moment that people are different. And let's concentrate on the... No, I don't want to do that. Let's concentrate on people being different. Okay. 
Uh, so model two, person I has characteristics Uh, I want to make that ZI because I'm going to use X for something else. Okay. Height, weight, and now it can be gender, can be ethnicity, it can be a dummy variable, an indicator variable. Okay. I'm not going to make any assumptions other than you don't have multicollinearity. And then what I'm going to say is that theta ki equals zi transpose beta k plus, uh, I'll call it beta zero k. Mm -hmm. So what does that say? That says that uh, uh, for each I, for each person, their characteristics differ, but the effect of their characteristics on the probabilities is going to be the same. So this is going to give me a P Y equals K. And now it's going to be given Z. And so now this is going to be Y I Z I. And that's going to equal EXP. I'll write it this way, beta zero K plus ZI transpose beta K divided by the summation L equals one through K EXP beta zero K plus ZI, in fact, this is L, pardon me, ZIT beta L. Now, this probability has a problem, and we'll talk about it in a second. Uh, I'm going to get rid of all of this. Let's just talk about this a little bit. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> what you can show is that this has a problem a little bit like when you do a regression with all of the dummies in there. And you recall that when you're doing a regression with a full set of dummies, you got to throw one of them out or you have multicollinearity. Same kind of thing here. It turns out that this model as it is, is not estimable. And so what you have to do is you have to pick a reference class. Okay. Okay. So you pick one of the cases, your reference class. And let's, let's pick uh, 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 reference class K as the reference class. If that's the case, then we're going to have this. The probability yi equals k given zi is going to be written as one over one plus the summation l equals one to k minus one exp beta zero L 
plus Z I transpose beta L. And what we've done here is we've basically done the following. We've set EXP beta zero one plus ZI beta one, we've set it equal to one. Okay. That's because we took one as the reference class. You can take other things as the refer ref reference class if you want. And why would you do that? You would do that because uh, you're interested in one thing rather than something else. <coughs> okay. How are you going to estimate this? Maximum likelihood. Okay. You're going to go find a uh, multi-class logic program. You're going to say, here's my model. What's your model going to look like? You're going to tell it what your classes are. You're going to tell it what the Z's are. And then it's going to estimate, uh, and you're going to say what the reference class is. And then it's going to estimate all those betas. It's going to give you standard errors and confidence intervals for them. And if you want to test some hypotheses about the betas, uh, you could test those uh, uh, quite easily. So for example, let's say that one of the Z's, let's go up to the one that's uh, normalized. Let's say that Z1i equals gender. And that it's one hot encoded. It's either it's one for female, zero for male. Okay. And let's say that you're looking at cars. Uh, you're looking at different types of cars, and somebody says, you know, gender doesn't matter. Okay. Gender doesn't matter. So what that would mean would be, would be the following. It would mean that uh, beta one, one, beta one, two, down to beta one K. So this is the gender response in class one, gender response in class two, gender response in class K, the, asser the assertion that, and I guess it doesn't, uh, K minus one, because uh, uh, we don't have a full, a full set there. The assertion is that in none of those does gender matter. And so this would be a joint hypothesis. And you would say, okay, I want computer, I want to test the hypothesis that all of the coefficients for gender are equal to zero. And it would do the test. It would say the p-value is uh, 0.003. And presumably we discussed in advance, we decided that maybe 0.5, uh, 0.05 would be an appropriate cutoff and 0.003 is very small, and we say that's just too unlikely if the null hypothesis is true, gender matters. That's how you would use this. Okay. We are moving away now from optimization and how you do the estimation. Uh, we leave that to the operations research folks, the applied mathematicians, and the, the uh, statisticians. Our job is to build probability models that can be analyzed, and our uh, workhorse, uh, at least uh, for a while, 
is going to be logistic regression or linear regression. Okay. <clears throat> So let's give some examples of this. Uh, and I'll ask you uh, all to uh, jump in and talk a little bit about this. Um, and then we'll move to our, our next model. So I'm gonna uh, erase this, but you should have your notes there so you can refer to them. And you will have a homework where you have to actually analyze the data I'm talking about here. So there is a uh, set of data, contraceptive data. Contraceptive choice. What are the contraceptive choices you could have? That is, what are the classes you might, might have? What are the alternatives that uh, people could choose? Uh, somebody name one alternative. Can you hear me? Uh, birth control. Okay, birth control. Let's be more specific than that. Oh, uh, or let's uh, like pill form. Pills, okay, pills. And it might be there are many of those. For now, let's just say there's a generic pill and that's what we're talking about. Anything else? Somebody give me another alternative. about condoms. Uh, any others? There's an important one. It's none. Well, you're gonna come up with a number of these and that's the first step in doing a model like this. Okay, what are the alternatives? What are the choices people have? And in these lectures, I'm assuming that everybody has the same choices, that they all know what the choices are and they choose between them. That won't always be the case. Okay. Sometimes people will have a limited set of alternatives. <clears throat> Sometimes that will come out of the data, but other times it will simply uh, be that uh, you could not have that kind of contraceptive in that country. It could be something like that. So let's just indicate, oh, let's just take the pill. Okay. <clears throat> what characteristics of a woman might dictate whether she uses the pill or not. Income. Income. Um, price of the pill. Price. 
What else? Whether they're sexually active. Like how emergency they're in. Uh, I don't quite understand that. Like if it's an emergency to take a pill. It's, it's like it's an emergency? Yep. Okay. Other things. If they have insurance. Could be. Although in a case like that, I might fold that into the price and say that is the price to the uh, person. And it, so it'd be whatever the market price was minus what insurance took care of. On the other hand, it might make a difference whether it's insurance covering it or you're covering it yourself. So that's possible. Anything else? Some policy? Like what? Uh, like um, restrictions for buying certain pills or? Okay, restrictions. Age might have an effect. Aha, uh -huh, age. And that's where uh, the woman who just mentioned restrictions, that's where this might come in, okay? So if it turns out that you're quote unquote underage, there might be restrictions. It also might be that in some parts of the world, there are restrictions. Anything else? Well, this is a medicine. Do medicines ever have side effects? The answer is yes. So stroke is one of those. And we're gonna talk about how you measure these things. Anything else? Well, what if my brand of pill is uh, an aspirin. And I call it contraceptive aspirin. And it's just aspirin. What's one of the things you would like to have your pill do? You want to know its effectiveness. Let's come over here to condoms. Okay. Now, this is something I want to point out. Whatever list you have over here, you need that list over here. And if you have a list over here, you've got to have the same list here. Now, it can be the weights on those things are zero, but you have to have the same set of characteristics Now, I want to go back here and look a little bit. Is price a characteristic of the woman? The answer is no. Is effectiveness a characteristic of the woman? No. Probably not. 
And this is going to lead us to saying, ah, you know, it's got to be more than just the characteristic of the women. And you're already seeing that. Now, what about stroke? Uh, young women typically don't have strokes. And if they've had a stroke, they're probably not going to buy any contraception uh, or they're dead. And yet, what might that be that would be a characteristic for the woman? How about susceptibility to strokes? Okay. Anything else that might enter in here? That's a characteristic of the woman. Preference to the substitutes. Hmm? Preference to the substitute of the pill. Uh, well, we're going to do that. We're just talking about the pill. Then we're going to talk about condoms. We'll talk about diaphragms. We'll talk about none. We'll talk about all the possibilities. But each, each one, the woman, the characteristics of the woman that are relevant to choosing contraception are all going to be the same. What other things should go in here? Well, how about religion? There's some religions where contraception is prohibited. So I'll put, put that in here. Okay. Others. What if you're in a family where another family member makes these decisions? So maybe you're in a, uh, a patriarchal family or a matriarchal family where your mother or your mother-in-law uh, makes the decision and you've got to do it. What I'm trying to get you to think here is all of the things that might affect all the characteristics of a person that might affect her decision to use contraceptives. Okay. And so we're going to call these Z for person I. So person I is going to have an income, religion, whether or not she's sexually active. How are we going to measure that? Okay. How are we going to measure that? I'm going to start asking these questions because when you're doing this study, it's easy to say, oh, stroke. And I say, okay, how do you measure that? Mm. Sexually active, how do you measure that? Maybe frequency? Uh, emergency, how do you measure that? Is that gonna be a dummy variable? Insurance, how are you gonna measure that? Have insurance, not in have insurance? Restrictions, how are you gonna measure that? You can't tell the computer, ah, just put some restrictions in there. You're gonna to have to tell the computer what to put in there. Age is easy. Stroke, susceptibility, maybe it's the probability uh, uh, this kind of woman, this, uh, you know, uh, we don't have ethnicity in here. We don't have any of those things in here. Uh, they might be things that would affect whether or not somebody had a stroke. 
You might also have weight. Notice education's not in here. Uh, you need to think about the whole array of things that might lead somebody to choose to use uh, uh, a particular kind of uh, birth control or not. Uh, let's not do condoms, let's do a harder one. So, do you think income has an effect on whether somebody would choose not to use birth control or not? Yeah. How about religion? Yes. Yeah. yeah. How about whether or not they're sexually active? Yes. How about emergency? We still have to figure out how to measure that. I'm gonna let the person who suggested that think about that for a while and then suggest to us how we would measure that. How about whether or not they had insurance? Probably. Restrictions, probably. Age, probably. Stroke, okay. Probably. Susceptibility to strokes. What else might be in there? Education. Yeah, education, we mentioned that. Let's put it in here. whether they actually want a child? Uh, interesting, yes. Uh, desire for child. Well, presumably, and this could get really complicated. Presumably, you wouldn't be using contraceptives if you uh, had no desire, uh, if you had a desire for a child. But as I'm thinking about this, this could be uh, this could be a problem. And how would you measure that? You go to somebody and interview her and say, on a scale of one to ten where one is, or zero is, I don't want a child, 10 is, I really, really want a child. Is that what I put in there? That's going to be a tough one to measure. By the way, you're going to see this come up over and over and over again, where they're really intuitive, common sense. This is a very common sense uh, feature. But then the question is, how are you going to measure that? How are you going to collect it? But why does it has to be like a level scale problem instead of like just asking them like one if you want a child and then zero will be you, you could do that you could do that one if you want a child zero if you don't <clears throat> but you're gonna get I'm sure you're gonna get well I guess if I had one you know I'm not really trying now but if we had one, that'd be fine. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I want one. Uh, eventually, if we have one now, that would be great. But, you know, it'd probably be better later on. Uh, but I wouldn't mind if we had one now. So how are you going to handle those intermediate things? And in fact, that that's a really good question you asked there, because we're going to see that that is precisely the problem with uh, uh, the Bayes rule, the Bayes classification rule. So you've, you've actually, if you had asked this question uh, uh, a half an hour from now, uh, 
you would be in a situation where I could segue right into the next part of the lecture. If like okay. those are the cases, like those answer are something we cannot handle. Is that like, is it possible those data will just put it into like, like not into like our either of like the testing or training data, like we just don't use them? Is that like well, a possible way to do it? What, what happens if you have, well, let's go to a regression. If you have a regression and there's a variable you can't measure, uh, uh, and you omit it, uh -huh. what happens to your regression? Well, if the omitted variable is correlated with something in your regression, and it's important, then you'll get an omitted variable bias. The same thing will happen with a logic. Okay. And desire for a child, here's what I would liken that to, and this is why this is a this is pretty good. Um, <clears throat> I want to uh, uh, know how a scholarship will affect uh, your performance uh, at university. Uh, so the scholarship affects your performance, but something else affects your performance too, ability. And we can't measure your ability. You know, we can measure your SAT scores, uh, but maybe you had a bad day when you took them, or maybe you had a great day when you took them, or maybe somebody took them for you. Uh, your grade point average. Uh, you don't have a very good grade point average because at the school you went to, people thought a C, a 2.0 was a fine grade for an average student. And it didn't matter that all of you got national merit scholarships uh, in the group that you got that had national merit scholarships, you were in the middle, so you got the 2.0. And so they're indicators, but uh, things like ability that are unobservable sometimes causes some problems. We'll talk a little bit about this if we have time at the end of the course. I'll talk a little bit about instrumental variables, but I don't think we'll have time. If you're interested in those kinds of questions, take Melissa Tartari's uh, causality class. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. What we're going to get then is we're going to get, uh, I'll call it uh, beta uh, pill, uh, beta condom, uh, beta three, beta, uh, beta nine, beta uh, five, et cetera. So I'm going to have uh, a set of betas for pill, set of betas for condom, set of betas for, and what you might find is, well, age doesn't really affect uh, using none, or it does. Uh, or you might find that younger women and older women uh, won't use none, but women of childbearing age will use none because they want to have a baby, and so on. So these betas can differ, and you have to choose one of them as the reference group. And typically, you would choose none as the reference group. Typically, you use none as the, as the reference group. Okay. So this is the logistic regression that uh, a lot of uh, the biotech people use. This is the logic. Okay. You have characteristics of the woman, and then the coefficients vary. You have characteristics of the car buyer, and the coefficients vary. But as somebody mentioned, you know, don't we want 
some of the features of the contraceptive itself in there. And so we're gonna look at model, what model am I in? Is this model three or model, this model next? So recall that this is theta ki. And I want to model this. And I'm now going to assume each alternative has characteristics. or features, okay? And so I'm gonna let XK be the features for alternative K, okay? And for now, I'm gonna assume, now I'm not gonna assume that. I'm gonna allow the alternatives to vary across individuals, the, the characteristics to vary. Not the alternatives, but the characteristics. So I'll let uh, 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 prices differ, uh, whether uh, it's covered by insurance or not differ, and so on, okay? And so in this case, we're going to have Theta ki equals <clears throat> xki. Whoops. Transpose beta. Mm -hmm. That is, for I'm going to assume that everybody has the same utility function. And we'll we'll handle that uh, in the model after this. And so the attractiveness depends upon the characteristics of the uh, 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 the alternative. And beta is something like a marginal utility. It really isn't, but it's something like a marginal utility. You can work out what it is. Mm -hmm. But beta measures the change in theta for a change in X. So if I were to change the price of this uh, alternative, how would that change uh, the behavior? Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Um, So this says probability y equals k given, uh, and now I'm going to have an x uh, uh, k, uh, an x1 i, x2 i, x k i. Okay, put an i here. And so this is the characteristics of the first contraception uh, method, second contraception method, all the way out to K, and all of these are going to be P by one vectors. Okay? All those are P by one vectors. <clears throat> and so this is gonna be of the form EXP, 
X K I transpose beta over the summation J equals one through capital K EXP X J I transpose beta. Again, the attractiveness of alternative K divided by the sum of the attractivenesses. Okay, again, how are you going to estimate this? You're going to go to a program. Uh, oh, I should tell you what the name of the program is. It's called MLogit. It's an R program. It's an R program, and it will do all of this stuff. It will take a little bit of work to master it because uh, it likes data set up in different ways depending on all sorts of things. So uh, it's something where if you're going to use it, you're probably going to spend two or three weeks trying to figure out how to get your data in the right order. By the way, that is par for the course for any new program you use, two or three weeks to get to the point where you can use it. So how is the computer going to do this? Well, you're going to tell it what the choice for an individual was. You're going to tell it what the uh, characteristics uh, of the first, second, all the way out to the kth alternative are. And then you're going to say, go do maximum likelihood. Okay. Let's say one of these is price. Okay, so we have a price for alternative one, price for alternative two, dot, 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 price for alternative K. You notice there's only one coefficient for price. And so if you wanted to test the hypothesis, does price matter? You would simply test, you would do a T test and that will come out in the uh, maximum likelihood. You would do a T test of whether or not the coefficient on price was equal to zero. Okay. This is called the conditional logic. And this is what uh, Dan McFadden got his Nobel Prize for, because he showed that this could come directly from utility theory. That is, he can derive this from first principles. <clears throat> okay. Now, let's do some interpretation here. Uh, I'm going to erase this and then rewrite this. <clears throat> and so we have that the probability that y equals k given x1 through xk, I'm going to leave the i's off now, is equal to exp xk transpose beta over the summation j equals 1 through k exp xj transpose beta. By the way, I want you to notice something here. I want you to notice that I don't have a beta zero in there. I don't have an intercept and I haven't pulled it into the X's either. These X's are in fact the characteristics of the alternatives. What I'd like you to do is put a constant in and see why there's no constant in there. Basically it's because it's gonna cancel out, but put a plus beta zero here, a plus beta zero here, and then see why it is that won't make any sense. And you would never have an intercept in the conditional logic. Now in the multinomial logic, you would. Now what I want to discuss here is the following. I have the probability y given k and the x's, and I'm just gonna write x to mean all of the x's. Probability y equals L, 
given the x's. And again, I mean all the x's, x1 through xk. And if you look at that, that is exp uh, xk transpose beta over exp xl transpose beta. And I'm gonna write that out as exp x k minus x l transpose beta. And the thing to note here is that the odds of choosing k over l depend only on the difference in the characteristics. So if there's no difference in the characteristics, this is going to be zero. This is going to be e to the zero, that's equal to one, and the odds are going to equal one. It's a toss up, okay, 50-50. If one of the xk's, if every one of the xk's in one is much better, bigger than the xl's in the other, okay, then uh, this number is going to be quite large, EXP to a quite large number is quite large, and the odds of choosing K over L are going to be quite large. Now, this feature that the odds depend only on the difference of the characteristics of the two uh, alternatives is called independence of irrelevant alternatives. I'm gonna write it a little bit differently. I'm going to note that the log odds, the y equals k given x over p y equals l given x is equal to x k minus x l transpose beta. This feature is called independence of irrelevant alternatives. Only on XK minus XL is called independence of irrelevant alternatives. Or IIA. Mm -hmm. Why is it called that? Well, if you have some other alternative, well, whoops, this should be L. Let's say we have alternative J, which is not one of these two. You'll note that the fact that you had a choice of our alternative J does not affect the odds or the log odds of choosing L over, uh, choosing K over L or L over K, depending on which way it goes. Okay. This is both a good thing and a bad thing. This is one of the really nifty things about logit models, about the conditional logit models. On the other hand, it's one of the things that uh, will cause some problems. And I will tell you what those problems are uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so let me show you why this is just really neat. <clears throat>
will be interesting. Say I know beta hat x1 through xk. And let's say these alternatives are uh, movies uh, that you have watched or could watch. Okay. Now a new movie comes out and I say, I would like to estimate the probability that people see this new movie. That's called a cold start problem. So let me give you an example. A new type of car comes out. The uh, Tesla when it came out. Entirely new type of car. I'd like to know whether or not people are going to buy it. But I can't wait until 300 people have bought or not bought to determine whether or not I can buy it, uh, I should make it or not. What I wanna do is I want to know what's the probability X number of people are gonna buy this or N number of people are gonna buy this. I have a new kind of uh, cell phone, an entirely new kind of cell phone. Uh, I want to know what's the likelihood people are going to buy this? How many of them are they going to buy? New phone. Okay. That's called the cold start problem because you don't have any evidence to start estimating with. <clears throat> okay. So, the new product has features X star. Okay. It's faster than some, it's more expensive than some, it has a bigger screen than some or a smaller screen than some. Uh, it has uh, better Bluetooth capability, it has a better uh, battery, and so on, okay? But it has variations of the characteristics that all the other cell phones have. Well, I have the attractiveness uh, for one is equal to EXP X1 transpose beta. The attractiveness for K, EXP, XK transpose beta. Orange is the wrong color here. Is that, can you see that? The A? No, doesn't look like it. Let's try this. I don't think that's gonna work. Let's try to read. There we go. A star is gonna be equal to EXP, X star transpose beta. That's not working well either. Well, let's go back to black. I'm going to leave those there. So what's the probability of Y equal, and I'll call it K plus one. This is the new product given X's and the X star. Well, what's the logit assumption? The logit assumption says, hey, 
it's the attractiveness of the new product divided by the sum of the attractivenesses okay. and how is that going to change or we say cannibalize the other alternatives well the other alternatives their attractivenesses are going to stay the same But this denominator is now going to be increased by a star. So let's say that a star is really big. So this new, this new uh, car, this new um, cell phone, it is just way better than everything else. What it says is that, that y equals k plus one is gonna be pretty big and the rest of the y's are all gonna go down. So let's say, for example, each one of these a's was, you know, around one you know, 1.1, 1.2, that sort of thing. There are K of them. So this is around, let's say the sum of these is 2K uh, and they're 10, so there's 20. So let's say that A1 through AK is 20 and A star is a thousand. So this becomes a, a thousand twenty divided by something that's, uh, divided into something that's around one and so, you know, it's like one in a thousand. This becomes almost one. And so what this would say is that this new product would incredibly cannibalize everything else. It would just take their uh, uh, probability away. And this is a really nifty feature of the multinomial logic. By the way, you can't do, I mean, of the conditional logic. You can't do this in the situation where you have the characteristics of the woman. Why? Because when you add a new um, alternative, you basically have to see how they all react to the new alternative before you can get the new beta i, the new beta k plus one. So that earlier model doesn't have this feature. Uh, this is, in fact, how we predicted where to put the various uh, stops and stations uh, along the BART line uh, way, way back in 1971. <clears throat> okay. So this is, this is a good thing about the uh, conditional logic. It's also a bad thing. What's bad about it? I'll show you. And this. this is called the red bus, blue bus problem. So let's say we have the following. We have uh, that. Uh, AW uh, is equal to the attractiveness of walking to work. Okay. And it might depend upon uh, the distance, it might depend upon um, uh, how much it costs, how, how long it takes, and so on. Okay. And let's let AB be the attractiveness of taking a bus. 
And for now, let's say those are the only two alternatives. Okay. Then the probability of walking is equal to AW over AW plus AB. That's really simple. Now I'm going to change things. I'm the transit director and I say, you know what? Uh, I want to have two kinds of buses. I want to have a red bus and I want to have a blue bus. And the red bus and the blue bus are going to arrive at exactly the same time in exactly the same place. And people are indifferent about whether they get on one or the other. But I want to have both of them. Okay. So my new set of alternatives, I have, I can walk AW. I can take the blue bus. I can take the red bus. Okay. So attractiveness of walking, attractiveness of blue bus, attractiveness of red bus. Now, do you think the attractiveness of walking has changed for anyone who walks or doesn't walk? No. No. Do you think the attractiveness of the blue bus and the attractiveness of the red bus are different from one another? No. Remember I said they're indifferent. People don't care. So that means the attractiveness is going to be the same. So uh, I'll put a prime on all these. Okay. So that's AW. This is going to be AB. And this is also going to be AB. Okay. okay, that's fine. So with these new alternatives, what's the probability that I walk? Well, it's AW divided by A prime BL plus A prime R. which is equal to AW over 2AB. You see that? And you go, wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense at all, okay? This, nothing's changed here except maybe you cut a bus in half and painted half of it red and half of it blue. The point is that now all of a sudden, the probability that you walk has dropped because of these two buses that I'm putting in there. Uh, AW being the denominator of that as well? Uh, oh, yes, pardon me. Thank you, yeah. I was jumping to the punchline too fast, okay? So, you will see that the probability of walking has dropped because I added these two alternatives. That is a consequence of the uh, independence of irrelevant alternatives. And the thing that's going on here is these are not really irrelevant. In fact, they are in fact the same alternative. And if you get deep down into it, what you'll find out is that error. So I'll write that, I don't want to use this. I'll write that over here. So recall that we had, uh, I'll call it theta w plus epsilon w, theta, uh, BL plus epsilon BL, theta red plus epsilon red. And remember one of the assumptions I made is that these were identically distributed and independent. 
Well, there's no way those errors can be independent. Any error you make in modeling BL is going to be the same error you make in modeling red. So these will probably be almost perfectly correlated. So if you have alternatives that are correlated, it will violate independence of irrelevant alternatives. And so when you do your modeling, you want to set up your alternatives so that you can argue that any mistakes you're making in the modeling, any variation, any variables that have been left out are independent across alternatives. If they're not, you're going to violate independence of irrelevant alternatives and we'll have to use a different model. Okay, that's going to be it for tonight. Next time I'm going to come back and I'm going to ask the question, what happens when I want to handle uh, uh, heterogeneity? And what do I mean by that? is that these betas are going to depend upon who the person is. And so I'm going to want not only the characteristics of the product, but I also want the characteristics of the individuals. And, uh, uh, and then I will talk about uh, specificity, recall, the ROC, and what's wrong with uh, the uh, uh, Bayes predictor idea. Uh, any questions? Uh, are you able to see the whiteboard? Okay, I know it's not ideal. I get in the way sometimes. Uh, let me know if you can't see the whiteboard, if I have to write bigger. Um, I can't think of any other way of doing this. Um, and uh, I just, I feel bad for people who are teaching physical chemistry. That's all I can say. Uh, anyway, that's it for tonight. I will see you next time. Yes. Oh, remember that you're absolutely indifferent between red bus and blue bus. It doesn't matter to you. I offer you one, you say, okay, I take it away and offer you the other, and you say, okay, fine. You literally are indifferent and you don't care. Okay. So it has to be the case that that theta BL plus epsilon BL is equal to theta R plus epsilon r. And the attractiveness is identical. You're indifferent between them, so those errors have to be the same as well. They have to be perfectly correlated in this case. This is the extreme. Uh, but if you don't have independence, so let's say there's just a little bit of correlation probably not going to hurt you too bad. What if it's 50%? I don't know. You know, it depends. What if it's 90%? That's going to hurt you a whole lot. And what you find is it doesn't hurt you uh, as much uh, in prediction. Uh, it hurts you when you try to predict what happens with new alternatives and it completely ruins your ability to test. That is your coefficients are just going to be wrong. They're gonna be biased. Um, and uh, uh, what's going to happen is the following. If you actually add the alternative, estimate another logic model, you'll find the coefficients differ significantly, maybe even differ in sign. And you wouldn't expect that to happen. Other questions? Okay, I will turn you over to Herbert.
Okay. Uh, so uh, how about let's just have four minutes break and then we will start by 7.30, okay? <laughs> 